our keynote address for this, the second night of University 2000. I'm Lee Papa from the Department of English, and in a moment I'll be introducing tonight's speaker, Anna Devere Smith. Our sign language interpreter this evening is Rebecca Behan. And I just want to say thanks to some of our speakers and performers today, including Reed Martin, the old-time banjo player, the Ball State Symphony Orchestra with guest artists Julia Larson Matern, Tom Masuko, and Dan Kamen, Billy Evans Horse and the Native American Intertribal Dancers, and finally, Tim Rollins, founder of Kids of Survival. Also, a special thanks to Helen Cherko, artist agent from the Royce Carlton Agency in New York. Tomorrow, upcoming events include, uh, just to continue this going, Kay Redfield Jameson of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and author of Unquiet Mind will be speaking here in this tent at 4 p.m. And Thomas Krenz, the Guggenheim World, Worldwide Director, whose keynote address will be on the arts and culture in the 21st century, will be at 8 p.m. also here in this tent. Anna Devere Smith is a writer and researcher. The texts for her plays, Fires in the Mirror, Crown Heights, Brooklyn, and Other Identities, and Twilight, Los Angeles, 1992, are created out of interviews with those involved in and around intense racial conflict. For her recent work, House Arrest, A Search for American Character in and Around the White House, she interviewed over 400 people and used historical documents to craft a play that moves from Thomas Jefferson's relationship with Sally Hemings to Bill Clinton's travails. Her research on each of her plays is edited and carefully crafted to reveal a tapestry of honesty and humanity in the most extreme circumstances or in the grandest of subjects. Ms. Smith acts in both senses of the word. She is an actor, you may know her from her film appearances in Philadelphia and The American President. However, on the stage, her texts become her one-woman shows. Ms. Smith alone embodies each of the people she has interviewed, whether a Korean grocer, Rodney King's aunt, the Hasidim of Crown Heights, or white policemen. When she performs, she recreates it all, all the stutters and stumbles of her subject's speech, as well as their smallest movements. She has been hailed as the most exciting individual in American theater by Newsweek. The New York Times said of her performances, she is the ultimate impressionist. She does people's souls. And she is an activist for the role of the arts in American society. She founded the Institute on the Arts and Civic Dialogue, which for three years at Harvard University explored the possible interactions between artists, activists, scholars, and members of the community. Projects from the Institute ranged from public dialogues to original music and dance pieces to new plays by Ms. Smith and others. In 1996, she wrote, if the theater chooses to, it can from time to time use its ability to entertain and to create spectacle to participate in civic discourse. The theater has shown us over time that it even has the potential to influence national attitudes. Finally, she is a teacher and she is taught. She has led seminars at Stanford, NYU, and Yale. Six years ago, I first taught the works of Anna DeVere Smith in a class on American drama. As I strive to get across to students the meaning and possibilities of performance on the stage, I could think of no better example than the PBS video of Fires in the Mirror, which is available, by the way, over at Bracken Library. On stage, Ms. Smith portrays, physicalizes the role of race in defining America, how we can never truly know this country without some open conversation on the role race has played in creating who we are at this moment. The enabling power of performance was clearly defined for those students. In all her work, she centers the role of the arts and especially the stage as a space for the exploration of community and culture, and how we all, whether inside or outside the protected grounds of a college campus, need to participate in that exploration. And she has inspired me and countless others to seek ways to join and bring others into the conversation. Her subject tonight is snapshots, glimpses of an America and change. Please join me in welcoming Anna Devere Smith. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
So if you're in the back, why don't you move to the front? Because we're all going to do some work together here, ultimately. Uh, you, at one point, will be talking, too, towards the end. My work here is only an invitation to whatever kind of conversation we can have together. Thank you for that extraordinarily well-prepared <laughs> introduction. Um, that's great. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Beth Turcott for what must be an incredible amount of work that she's been doing to bring all of you together. Um, you know, I feel a sense of history being here with you because uh, I learned about something that happened in Muncie, Indiana, and I don't mean that David Letterman went to school here. Um, but last year, I came across a, what I think is an American masterpiece uh, that took place right here, briefly, in Muncie, Indiana. And those of you who know your history know that I'm talking about Robert Kennedy uh, speaking on the back of a flatbed truck on the occasion of the death of uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King and probably one of the most exquisite but brief um, uh, articulations of America in race that I have ever heard. And didn't learn about it until last year when I came across a tape of it. So to be here one year later is particularly meaningful to me since I've dedicated my life to trying to find out more and more uh, about how America in its fragments can become a merger I'm not talking about a business merger. I'm talking about a human merger. And that's what I want to talk with you about tonight. Um, I'm an actress. And so in the course of my talking to you, uh, sometimes I'll seem like a totally normal person, or I think you think I'm a totally normal person. And sometimes I won't. And so I thought that um, I would start with the won't and then move back to the normal and then go to the won't. Um, I like to start many of my speeches with the person who I consider my mentor. He doesn't know I go around the country calling him that, but he is. Uh, Mr. Studs Turkle, who I believe is now 88 years old, uh, living well, I'm sure, uh, at this very moment in Chicago. Um, but I see myself in the tradition of Studs in the work that I do. And so um, I'm going to start out by doing Studs and ask Studs through me to carry the message of tonight. Um, and I should tell you uh, that everything I do when I and in the won't, that is the performance, um, uh, is verbatim, something that somebody actually said to me word for word on a tape recorder. I asked Studs if he could tell me of a defining moment in American history, and this is what he said to me. Defining moment in American history. I don't think there's one. Can't say how worse my that's a big moment. I don't think there's anyone. I can't pick out any. It's a combination of many. And I think of them, I'd say is a I can't think of anything I'd say is a defining moment, but the gradual slippage. <laughs> slippage is the word used by the people in Watergate. Moral slippage. It's a gradual kind of thing. Combination of things. And so, and we also, so the funny thing is we also have the technology. I say less and less. The human touch. Oh, oh, oh I could tell you another funny little playlet. <laughs> yeah. See, the Atlanta airport is a modern airport. And as you leave the gate, there are these trains that take you out to a destination and out to a concourse. And these trains are smooth and they're quiet and they're efficient. And there's a voice you hear on the train. You see, the voice was a human voice. You see, in the old days, we had robots. And the robots imitated humans. Now we have humans imitating robots. So you got this voice on this train. Concourse 1, Dallas. Fort Worth, Concourse 2, Omaha, Lincoln, same voice. Just as that train is about to go, a young couple rush in, and they're just about to close the pneumatic doors, and that voice, without losing a beat, says, because of late entry, we're delayed 30 seconds. Just then, everybody is looking at this couple with hateful eyes. 
days, and the couple is going like this, you know, shrinking. <laughs> and I'd happen to have a couple of drinks before boarding. <laughs> I do that to steal my nerves, and so I imitate a chain call, holding my hand over my, George Orwell, your time has come. <laughs> Everybody laughs when I say that, but not on this train. <laughs> Silence. And so suddenly, they're looking at me and the couple. And so here I am as a couple, the three of us at the foot of Calvary, about to be up, you know. <laughs> Just then, I see a baby, a little baby in the lap of a mother. I know it's Hispanic because she's speaking Spanish to her companion. So I'm going to talk to the baby. So <laughs> I see the baby holding my hand over my mouth because my breath must be a hundred proof. I say to the baby, sir? Oh, madam, what is your considered opinion of the human species? <laughs> the baby looks, you know, the way babies look at you clearly and starts laughing, starts busting out with this crazy little laugh. And I said, thank God for a human reaction we haven't lost yet. But, but the human touch, that's disappearing, you see. You see, so you talk about a defining moment. There ain't no defining moment for me. It's an accretion of moments that add up to where we are now, where trivia becomes news. And more and more, less and less awareness of the pain of the other. So this is an interesting dilemma with which we're faced. I don't know if you can use this or not. I was quoting Wright Morris, the writer from Nebraska, who says, we're more and more into communications and less and less into communication. That studs. So that's my first won't be like a normal person. Um, you see, uh, I know that one thing you're celebrating, looking at, understandably, is the millennium. Studs was not so enchanted with the 20th century, uh, where he claims we've learned nothing, nothing from the sinking of the Titanic. He was born in 1912, the year the Titanic sank. Bam! It came, it, it went down, and I came up! <laughs> he described the Titanic, wow, some century. He described the Titanic as an arrogant gesture in the first place. And what did we learn from it where, where a force of nature was overpowered, where a uh, force of nature overpowered man's arrogance? So as we are now perched in the dawn of this new century, Studs Turkle hopes for a turn to civility. And a lack of civility is, as he told me, not after all belching at the dinner table. A lack of civility is forgetting to care about your fellow man. A lack of civility is forgetting about the old, those less fortunate, in order to squeeze a little more of your own earned dollar. Hoping then, you see, for a turn with regard to compassion, which by Studs' estimation is on the decline as we slide downhill hill, really, even in this very dark. On. I also have a friend who marked that other century named Verna Mullen, 97 years old, born in 1903, who lives in Palo Alto, California. Call her Auntie Verna. Each day she works in her garden where she expects to die, as her mother did, under the shade of the bean plants. Yet this year something went wrong with the beans. The seeds froze in the refrigerator. I'm going to read to you from a letter. I know why the bean seeds did not come up. They froze. Of the 21 seeds put into the paper cups to watch over in the greenhouse, only one, one, I repeat, has come up. Tomorrow morn, I'll transfer the plants which came up 
21 hills of five beans each and we'll have a much smaller plot. That means it will be nigh impossible for me to drop dead a la mom in the bean patch this year. Not enough shade. <laughs> Well, that sounds like good news, although it seems that she has two contradictory objectives. One is to die like her mother did in the proper bean shade, and two, to see more of this remarkable century that we have in front of us after having lived for most of the one before. And I worry if the last century leaves us in such a situation that actually we've been educated to see only what we want to see. And sometimes I worry that a world war or a full dramatic force of nature or some kind of intergalactic spectacle that we can't imagine is what would make it otherwise. I was once in a conversation with Auntie Verna and a group of people in their 20s, my students, and the conversation exploded into a polite but emotional controversy when Auntie Verna told us her version of the Japanese internment. Her assessment actually came in the form of a story about dinner parties that she used to give on a regular basis. A mild subplot was the Japanese internment. There was a Japanese man who had helped her around the house and helped her with her parties to set them up and clean up after them. One day he was gone, that's all she said, he was gone. A young woman of Japanese descent in our group perked up immediately as if she had special antenna for this very sort of thing. Until that time, there had been no aggressive questioning of Auntie Werner as her age and nearly translucent skin engendered hushed tones, fascinated stares, and a great deal of deference. What do you mean he was gone? Her voice punctuated the reverent air. Auntie Verna stared wide-eyed and with no expression. He just didn't show up again. You mean you never tried to find out more about him? There was a pause. Well, no, her old voice, as old as sand and water, it seemed, called out. Auntie Verna, in actuality, believed that given the circumstances of her life, his disappearance was the best thing for national security. As Auntie Verna sat among this group of about 30 young people, I watched her like a party gone sour. She dressed for us, necklace and earrings, and she sat among us. We were eager to sit at her feet, to marvel at her as a living monument of the 20th century. We wanted to hear her stories, her wisdom. Yet these young people, 20-some years old in the 90s, exploded in indignation, rage, disgust, confusion about the lessons they had learned, lessons which made this attitude towards a victim of the internment seem completely unacceptable. It was as, nothing, it was as if nothing she said for the, in the course of an hour mattered. No other evidence of her character counted. Not that she made homemade fig bars, not that she worked hard for years, first as a seamstress, then as a secretary, unable in her day to use her degree from Berkeley, for God's sake. Not that she had labored hard in her garden, canned, and still cans tons of apricots every year, nothing. How could she be so unaware of in the internment and what it meant, at least what it meant as they had been schooled post-1970s? Truth be told, if we added up the hours they spent studying the internment as a group and averaged it out, wouldn't be that many. Perhaps a young woman of Japanese descent had many hours of such study as, after all, it was connected to her identity. The woman with, from Japanese descent fell into tears at what she saw as Auntie Verna's lack of compassion. Some in the room quite honestly couldn't measure their own compassion about the matter, so their faces seemed to search for an appropriate grimace, furrow, bow, brow, or expression. I watched them then divide into two groups, those who walked tentatively to console Auntie Verna, who they saw as a frail woman battered by political correctness, and those who tentatively went to console the young woman of Japanese descent, who they saw as battered by the intellectual class and cultural brutality of a few centuries of white supremacy. <laughs> All of this oddly being exemplified by Auntie Verna's aged skin, being exemplified by her eyes, which showed little expression, and by her stories of dinner parties, which seemed to this audience to be glib events, which proved just how thoughtless she was. And as for the young woman of Japanese descent, her tears, her alarm, her emotion was dismissed by the other side as political correctness. You see, that's where we ended up in the 90s. We ended up in a certain dilemma where the expertise of me, the expertise of me 
is so overdeveloped that we have very little room for the possibility of us, us, big us. That us is what Robert Kennedy was urging for and asking for almost 30 years ago in Muncie, Indiana. Myself, my loyalties were complex. I didn't tentatively walk towards either side. Like the great, famous hero and slavery, Harriet Tubman, in my soul, I was running for freedom, running for a freedom of identity which would allow me to find a way of analyzing these differences of opinion with a broader view of the world. I was confused, frankly, about why the conversation dissolved into sides. I'd been mesmerized by the conversation. It seemed to me to be a gorgeously emotional canvas with the possibility of subtlety, even the dramatic possibility of no resolution, that nobody was right. The young, pretty, smart, intense woman with dark hair, a beautiful face, voicing indignation, alarm, and sorrow to an old woman who could hardly hear, and, and who could hardly hear her emotion, hardly hear her intellect. It was difficult to tell from where I was sitting if Auntie Verna was hard of hearing or if her face was so old that it didn't, didn't express compassion anymore. <laughs> or if she just didn't understand, or if she just didn't care. Either way, I thought it was bittersweet and true, two generations with two different standards. Of course, if Auntie Verna had, the, had some of the same Pacific Rim education as most of the people in that room, she would have confessed, perhaps a guilt, regret, that she didn't know what happened to her Japanese handyman. Maybe she was even in denial. But having been educated in the 20s, she lacked that. I realized how much little appreciation and how little imagination there was for circumstances in that room. This dissolving into side seemed like such an easy way out. And suddenly I see that our challenge is to call up once more that now almost rusty image of a bridge. The challenge we face is how to weave together the new stories that we know, the stories that you know that I didn't know when I was in college. How do we weave together those stories? Perhaps there's a challenge that we have to look at Auntie Verna as more knowledge rather than to categorize her as more evidence. Is a classroom a court of law? The challenge is to stay out of what I call our safe houses of identity. Sometimes they're safe because we only know as much as we need to know to keep our stories consistent. And in each case, the story dissolves to, I'm right, you're wrong. The challenge is to find a believable voice that says, hey, wait a minute, identity is a process. And even inside of your safe house of identity, don't be so sure about intellectual purity. If you don't go out, you have no way of testing your truths. The 20th century left us in houses, safe supposedly, in houses of distinct safe identity. We see elsewhere in the world how dangerous such safe houses can become if they mobilize against each other. Look, I'll talk to you about one housing development and you'll see how complicated the houses are. Let's take the women's housing development. There's no one woman's house. In reality, the women's houses aren't even in the same village. They're actually in villages that are defined by race and class, not gender. There's the black woman's house, the old woman's house, the house for battered women, the house for lesbian women, the house for bisexual women, the house for mothers, which is the house for fathers and children. Then there's a house for single mothers, the house for non-mothers. Then there's the white woman's house, the poor woman's house, the CEO woman's house, the incarcerated woman's house of correction the Asian woman's house, the homeless woman's house, the 20-year-old woman's house, the house of women over 40, the house of women with cancer, the house of women with AIDS. I worry as I just listed all the houses, which house I seem to be in because of the house I failed to list. So what happens when you come out of your house? I'm going to share with you now a story of a woman who I met when I went to Crown Heights, Brooklyn, where riots had broken out in the streets because the, a car in the entourage of a religious leader, uh, the Grand Rebbe uh, of uh, the Lubavitch community, Hasidic sect, uh, a car in his entourage ran a red light, jumped the sidewalk, and killed a young black boy. This was in 1991. In retaliation, young black youths in the streets enraged, stopped, harassed, and stabbed a young Hasidic scholar visiting from 
Australia. Riots broke out for days. I went there to try to get the stories firsthand. And I met this very interesting woman who chooses not to be known. I only call her the anonymous Lubavitch woman. And she has a story for us which tells us how inevitably we have to come out of our house. And the imagination that that coming out calls for. <clears throat> this is called static. Well, it was um, getting to the end, the end of Shabbos, and it was like 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and it was in the summertime, so sunset was until like about 8, 9 o'clock. And so we still had a few hours left to go. And my baby had been playing with the knobs on the stereo system, and all of a sudden he pushed the button in, you know, the on button, and all of a sudden came blaring out at full volume, sort of like a half station of polka music. But it was just like static but blaring, blaring. And we can't turn off, you know, we can't turn off electrical, you know, electricity on Shabbos. So um, there was, a, 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 we were just trying to ignore it. But uh, a young boy who was visiting us, he said it was driving him nuts already. Couldn't we do something about it? It was giving him such a headache. Couldn't I have a baby turn it off? Because, well, we can't make the baby turn it off, but if a child under three, turn something on or turn something off, then it's not considered a, um, then it's not against the Torah. And so, um, uh, we put the baby by the radio and tried to get the baby to turn it off. And he just made it worse. And, uh, so, uh, our guest was so uncomfortable that I said, well, I will go outside and see if I can find somebody who's not Jewish and see if maybe they would like to turn it off. Because you can have somebody who's not Jewish do a simple act like turning on a light or turning off a light. Um, oh my, oh, I hope I have the law correct. <laughs> Oh, but you can't ask them to do it directly. They have to do it of their own free will, and hopefully they would get some benefit from it too. So uh, I went outside and I saw a little boy in the neighborhood who I didn't know and he didn't know me. No, not Jewish. And uh, well, uh, he was black. And oh, and um, and he wasn't wearing a yarmulke. Well, because you could be Jewish if you were black, but I figured with those two things. So um, I went over to him and I said that my radio was on really loud and I can't turn it off. Could he help me? And he looked at me like, well, and uh, I just said, <laughs> I don't know what to do. So he follows me into the house and he hears this music on so loud and so unpleasant. And he goes over to the radio and he says, you see this button here? <laughs> it says on and off. Push that in. And so I just stood there, you know, looking sort of dumb. And so we pushed it in. And we laughed, we said. And this kid probably thinks, and they say Jewish people are supposed to be really smart. <laughs> and they don't know how to turn off their radios. That's my friend from Crown Heights. <laughs> So there's a challenge. Come out of your house. Come out of your defined identity to do more work, more good work. Race, race was and is one of the bloodier dramas of the last century. So what do we have in store? I find myself appreciating how far we've come, but I fantasize and wonder and question exactly where are we gonna go? Is mixed race, birth, and marriage really the answer? Is the fact that California is now a minority white really the answer? In some ways, I don't think we've come very far at all. 
As I told you, I interview people with the tape recorder, represent what they say word for word, trying to capture American character, trying to put myself in other people's shoes and body to learn the things about who they are because our culture doesn't give me that merged. It only gives it to me in fragments. And I even took a look at history in my last project, <clears throat> looked at presidents throughout history, wondering to what extent they bring us together, to what extent they don't. And so I landed for quite a bit of my thinking in Jefferson's territory. And of course, I went to his home in Monticello. And I met there a tour guide who gives us a very good picture of the unmerging that is in our heritage. So we're working with that. We are descendants of that. <clears throat> this is Penny Kaiser, tour guide at Monticello, and this is property. Okay, okay, he couldn't take care of it. What, what, what's another reason? Those, those are good reasons. What else do you think? What else? Thinking he never learned, right? Jefferson was just a big boss. He was, yeah, he was. Most people say, well, economically, he couldn't afford it, and that is true. You know, Thomas Jefferson... $107,000 in debt, and many of his slaves were mortgaged, so he didn't have the right to sell them, uh, I mean to free them. But also, um, Thomas Jefferson said, you know, to free people brought up in the habits of slavery is like abandoning children. Remember that law of 1806 where they had to leave within a year? That uh, played a big part in his decision, too. He said, until America is ready, these slaves can't be free. We all have to agree. Now, you know, in his notes on the state of Virginia, now, some of us may say, well, that's kind of a cop-out for Thomas Jefferson. But in his notes on the state of Virginia, he had a plan. And his plan was, I think he sort of set the year December 31st, 1800, and he said, let's everybody, he said, by then, this is the age of the Enlightenment, everybody will know that slavery is wrong. And by that year, uh, by that year, let's take all the new babies born that year, and we're going to separate them from their mothers and fathers. He said, I know it's going to be hard, but we've got to do it. And he said, the government's going to pay, and we're going to train them according, he said, to their genius in trades. Then, when the women reach 18 and the men 21, we're going to take them lock, stock, and barrel and place them in a black community. Maybe in the West Indies. Maybe back to Africa. Because he said, uh, they were will never forgive us for what, uh, how we treated them. So uh, that was his plan. We will start trading. They're going to have their own little country. We'll pay until they're ready. Okay, that was his plan. He was so disappointed when by 1800, you know, nobody's ready to do it. One of his friends, Edmund Pogues, writes to me and says, now listen, I'm leaving Virginia and I'm freeing my slaves and you ought to do the same thing too. You ought to be the example. But Thomas Jefferson just said no. He said, I'm so sorry you have to leave Virginia. He said, I just cannot, you know, abandon my family. He knew the time would come and he felt that eventually everyone would agree, but until that time, he just said, you know, he wouldn't do it. But you know, too, the first 40 years of Thomas Jefferson's life, he speaks out against slavery. The last 40 years, he gets real quiet. Um, another thing uh, he said about slavery, uh, he said, uh, we have the wolf by the ear. You may have heard this quote. Uh, we, he, we can neither hold him or safely let him go. Justice is in one scale, self-preservation in the other. Any questions about that? <laughs> Justice is in one scale, self-preservation in the other. Those were our beginnings. Where did the 20th century leave us? <clears throat> I went to an experimental school, actually. It was a regular public school, but the experiment was um, in my class. And the experiment was that if 
if colored children were given the same advantages as white children, this was a segregated school, then we would perform as well or perhaps nearly as well as white children. So we had a twin school out in the suburbs. We each had French lessons given by the same French teacher, a French Canadian, a white woman, the only white teacher I had with red hair. There was also the new math. Our teachers would go across town to a place called 25th Street uh, and learn the new math and bring it back to us. At certain times during the year, our all-colored class would be visited by an audience of white grown-ups who would sit together in the back of the room. My mother says I'm exaggerating here, but it's my memory and she's not here. <laughs> At certain times during the year, our all-colored class would be visited by an audience of white grown-ups who would sit together in the back of the room and watch us learn. Our mothers always starched our clothes, polished our shoes, and pressed our hair for the occasion. I did not press mine for this. I've grown. Uh, <clears throat> There was, you see, the pressure to perform. We were early on performing race and being cast in race. A mini finish line was the end of segregation. Junior high brought the possibility of going to a white school. One's ability and intellectual worth was evaluated on the outside by the number of white students in one's class. Again, an aesthetic, external, broad stroke evaluation, which looks at the picture, but not at what's inside of the picture. If you were one black among many, you were surely extraordinary and headed for freedom. So what's next? What's next? It's probably still true if, there, if one is a single black among many whites, one is considered extraordinary. Just as if one is a single woman among men or a single man among women, one is extraordinary. Excellence is perhaps measured by the degree to which one can infiltrate. Excellence is perhaps measured by the possibility of integration, or at least standing at the frontier without retreating. Yet integration, supposedly the end of segregated housing, schools, and organizations, was a watershed opening for the construction of safe houses. Construction jobs appeared suddenly for building safe houses where one could retreat into one's own biological identity as female, as of color, as gay. Some situations were clear examples of non-biological realities winning out over biology. Mixed race people with white mothers who raised them in white environments would still call themselves colored and usually chose to stay in the safe house of their colored person's color, their colored parent's color. These safe houses were constructed supposedly to build up one's stamina for the brutal world of the other and to heal one's wounds after facing the cold, brutal world of the other. And they were and are important because these wounds are real. Libraries of new knowledge were developed. Female bonding took place. Feminism was born and so were a multitude of studies of ethnicity. History was corrected and refurbished. Black and other assortments of ethnic pride and challenges to the canon were born. And now I understand that we have even white studies. Identity politics quickly became a kind of mainstream of its own. I wonder now if these safe houses were keeping us safe from the brutal world of the other, or were they the only alternative? Perhaps they really were, and this is my optimistic point of view about this, waiting rooms. The mainstream perhaps was not ready for integration, not ready for a human merger. Few of us are hidden. Few of us are indistinguishable in the rushes of the mainstream. The closer you got to the water, the more visible you came. And when you arrived and took off your shoes, somebody freaking would say, right this way, there's a changing room under the tree. You can be with the people who are just like you. We sang to dream the impossible dream, but we got sentimental, not courageous. We took it too much word for word. The 21st century needs a bigger heart a lustier spirit, a spirit which is bigger than words, a spirit which is bigger than affirmation, bigger, more trusting than identity politics, a spirit which is bigger than evidence, yet hungry to know, to really know, no matter what it looks like. The atmosphere around the mainstream was not, in the end, healthy for parity, 
and the playing field was not level. There were many bumps, there was even mud, swamp, many inconsistencies. And a lot of times, particularly now, we get diverted from the real issue by the media's infatuation with less problematic issues. And my example for that to stay for just a second with Thomas Jefferson <clears throat> comes from Ken Burns, the filmmaker, who I ran into <laughs> one morning in a hotel in Paris. And luckily, I had my tape recorder, slapped it down in front of him at the be breakfast table, and asked his opinion of the story about Thomas Jefferson and his supposed, well, now DNA tells us it's not supposed, mistress and mother of his children, Sally Hemings. And this is played, this is called Teacup, Ken Burns. It doesn't matter. <laughs> he owned her. Get the story straight. I mean, he could have killed her if he wanted. He owned her. He could have done anything with her. He could have murdered her. They could have said, Mr. President, where's Sally? And he could have said, oh, I killed her last night. She displeased me, and there wasn't a law in the land that could have touched him. The fact of whether he did or he didn't, this late 20th century obsession with all things sexual, titillating, and celebrity-driven is an anathema to historical truth. He owned her. And we forget the fact, but the fact that the man who authored the world's words, which we consider our creed, held and chattel slavery more than 200 human beings, one of whom was a young and weird told attractive potential lover for him, but it doesn't matter. The sexual politics are overwhelmed by the fact that he owned her. I like the free song that comes from both sides. Yes, of course he did, but no, 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 absolutely he didn't. But he owned her, goddammit, he owned her. That's the point, he owned her. And that's what we forget. We say, yes, yes, yes. I say, okay. So can I tell you about slavery? I said, how would you like to live in a one-room dirt floor shack 14 by 14 in which you work 14 hours a day less there's a full moon and then you work more? You are not paid. You can be beaten. You can be separated from your family. In fact, they changed the wedding vows for slaves to read till death or distance do you part. You are susceptible to every known disease of which there is no cure. You are denied the possibility of an education. In fact, in many instances, you could be punished for learning a language or having a literature or having a culture. Now, tell me how long you would like to live under this. I would say that a generation's too long, a decade's too long, a year's too long, a month's too long, a week's too long. I submit if you were asked to do that, you might try it on for 20 minutes. That he owned her. <laughs> You know, you know, he owned her. If I own you, you know, when I said I, he could have killed her, you say, oh, well, hell yeah, but he wouldn't have. His nephews murdered one of his slaves, and that slave's crime had been to break a teacup that had belonged to their mother, and there was no recourse in the United States of America. He's both the blessing and the curse. As John Hill Franklin said, he, he ensured that we would inherit the poison of indecision on race, and yet he also wrote us the prescription for the antidote for the serum that would cure us. Jefferson said that slavery was like holding a wolf by the ears. You didn't like it, but you didn't dare let go. It's Ken Burns. Listen, you might wonder, as I did, what we were missing a couple years ago when there was a young woman not named Sally Hemings, but Monica Lewinsky in our consciousness. I had the opportunity to go to Washington and a few months before the Monica Lewinsky story broke, I was sitting in the Oval Office with President Clinton and because uh, Washington has become such a dangerous place, I mean, I met so many people who went there to help out, you know? <laughs> Ended up in front of Senate committees. Thought they were going there to change the world. Lie detector texts, stuff like that. Where's the truth? So <clears throat> even the president, even before Monica Lewinsky, as you know, was in considerable hot water off and on. And, so I asked him in that meeting if he felt like a common criminal. And this is called Baby Huey Dolls. And this is what he told me. <clears throat> Mr. President, do you feel like a common criminal? I think, um, I think George Washington said that. I said he was a 
treat a sort of like a common criminal. I don't know about that. No, I wouldn't say that. But I think in terms of the way uh, uh, a president in the White House, even far more than Congress, gets pilloried in the press and accusations are breathlessly printed and then <laughs> disproved later, they're nowhere to be seen. No one ever says, hey, you remember that thing? They were totally innocent. You don't see that. The political press has this image that the presidency is so all-powerful that none of the presumptions should apply. No presumption of innocence, no presumption that some techniques and things are off balance. Now, if you're really tough, you can handle it. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse, but I think it reached a real new pinnacle with me. Partly because, uh, well, I mean, with this very well-funded radical white wing in America that thinks it's entitled to control the White House. And uh, <clears throat> I think we really ought to ask ourselves, do we want to put our public officials basically in the position of having to bankrupt themselves just to survive in office? And another real problem with this get the president mentality is it becomes almost impossible to say the right thing to do the right thing, to say that the right thing to do is to be honest, because if you're honest and say, hey, I made a mistake, I made all this money to clean, I spent all this money to clean it up, they use that to make you look more guilty. And I just think it's gotten totally out of whack. I mean, it's chilling when you really think about what happened. You know, I, I was so naive that I really believed them when they said if we were honest and forthright, it would clear the air. And that every fact was interpreted to make us all look criminal, craven, and corrupt. When Hillary's uh, legal bills were found, oh, it was all over the papers, right? She had to go talk to the grand jury. First lady talking to the grand jury. Big pictures. Then what happened? We said, we don't know where these came from, but they're glad they turned up because they support her story. Why would we cover up records that support her story? That's what we said. That was down in paragraph 10 here. Then what happened? Another totally independent inquiry by a Republican law firm spent $3.6 million looking at all the documents and savings and loans. You know what it said? No basis for criminal action, no basis for civil suit. The records support Hillary's account. Did all those people who blared the record discovery, who blared the grand jury testimony all over America bother to tell the American people that that's what this report done by a Republican law firm after they spent almost $4 million said? No. Little bitty notice me. So, what I'm saying is, you know, I'm fine. <laughs> we're standing here, we're still showing up for work, we're fine. Bad for America, bad for the system, makes good people less willing to run, and it corrupts the search for the truth. Because the target, well, I think most of them think the truth is nice, but it's not essential. Because the only target in the White House, the only target is the White House. If Congress does this, it's not so bad. I told you what that Republican senator told me, and you can use this. He said, before you got elected, we were stupid enough to think the press was liberal. And then we realized, he said, and then you got more grief than anybody ever gotten before. And then we realized that they are liberal in the sense that most of them vote Democratic. He said, they vote with you, but they think like us. And I asked him what he meant. He said, he said, he said, he said, he said, you're a Democrat. He said, you come here thinking you could do good. You want to use the power of the government to make good things happen to improve people's lives. He said, Republicans are suspicious of the ability to make anybody's life better. He said, we like this because we want power. And the press, they want power. So let them vote with you. They think like us. When you're in, they get power, and we get power the same way. We hurt you. So never mind what the truth is, hit the target. Now, I just keep standing I, I, I just keep standing up. I'm like one of those old baby Huey dolls you have in your kid. You punch them and they come back up, so I'm fine. <laughs> but it's bad for the country. It's bad when the system doesn't care whether the attack is true or not. It's bad when the burden of proof is on the accused, and you're supposed to disprove all conceivable accusations, present or future, and if you don't, there's something wrong with you. It's bad when innocent middle-class people who work in the White House can be bankrupted by exorbitant legal fees. It's bad when, uh, let's take, that's the president. <laughs> Always looking for evidence now in America to find the truth. I don't think the truth is the same as evidence. First of all, the truth is not always evident. I learned about Harriet Tubman by scurrying through the streets of Baltimore with my grandmother to pay her news, by, to pay her dues by hand, in person, in cash, out of a small bank in which she collected pennies and coins for the specific purpose of the Harriet Tubman Club. As the treasurer's hallway was cool and dark, and as the treasurer's short, heavy set, strong looking, and very, very dark skinned with a gleaming white toothy smile, I'd always thought that the Harriet Tubman Club was a secret club where Harriet Tubman was kept alive in some mystical tribal way. 
There was a smell of food, but we were never offered any, except at the annual Harriet Tubman picnic in a, picnic in a segregated park. I learned about Harriet Tubman not from words, not from evidence, not from words, not from evidence, but by the rhythm of my grandmother's scurry, the way we moved briskly through the street with our feet barely coming off or touching the ground. I thought that Harriet Tubman was a woman of few words and much movement. Grandma never talked about the club or its meetings. She just paid her dues. And what are the dues? What are the dues that we pay in our safe houses of identity? As I come to a conclusion, I'm going to wrap up with two people. One who was shocked when the promise of America didn't come out right, that it wasn't enough to stay in her safe house and do her work. Mrs. Young Sun Han, who I met in Los Angeles during the riots there, after the riots there, uh, a liquor store owner whose store was burned to the ground. <clears throat> this is called Swallowing the Bitterness. And I must tell you that I title all of my pieces because I believe that people speak in organic poems. And I think that this is one of the most gorgeous poems I've ever heard about our situation in our fragments in America, in our unmerging the unmerging emergency, the unmerged, swallowing the bitterness. When I was in Korea, I used to watch many luxurious Hollywood lifestyle movie. I never saw any poor man, any black, maybe uh, one housemate. I used to believe America was the best. I still do. I don't deny that just because I am a victim. But at the end of 92, when we were still in turmoil and having all the financial problems and all the mental problems, I began to really realize that Koreans are completely left out of this society, and we are nothing. Why? Why? Why do we have to be left out? Is it because we are Korean? Is it because we have no politicians? Is it because we don't speak good English? Why? Why did we have to be left out? We were not qualified for medical treatment, we were not qualified for food stamp, no GR, no welfare, anything. Many African Americans who never work got minimum amount of money to survive, we didn't get any because we have a car and a house and we are high tax payer. Where do I find the justice? <laughs> okay? Many black people probably thought they won by the verdict. I was sitting here watching television the morning of the verdict and all the day, and they were having a party all of South Central. They celebrated all the churches. And he said, well, finally, we found that justice exists in this society. Then what about victims' rights? They got their rights by destroying innocent Korean merchants. <laughs> they have a lot of respect, as I do. For Dr. Martin King, he is the only mother of a black community. I don't care, Jess Jackson. He is the mother of non-violence, uh, non-violence, uh, and they were all right to be in his spirit. Then what about Los Angeles in 1992? They destroyed innocent people. And I wonder if that is really justice for them to get their rights in that way. I was uh, swallowing the bitterness, 
sitting here alone and watching them. They became so hilarious. But I was happy for them. I was glad for them. At least that they got something back, OK? Let's just forget about Korean victims and other victims. They fought for their rights for over two centuries, and maybe because they sacrificed other minorities, Hispanic, Asian, we would uh, suffer more in the mainstream. That's why I understand. That's why I have a mixed uh, feeling about the verdict. But I wish that I could be part of their enjoyment. I wish that I could live together with black people, but after the riots in 1992, is too much difference. The fire is still there. It's still there. How do you call it? Uh, igniting fire. Igniting fire is still there. It can uh, burst out any time. This is Young Sun Han. <laughs> well, I'm going to end now with a, a woman who tells us what happens when you're forced to move out of your safe house, and I'm going to give you that as a model, hoping you'll have that opportunity to lead others. But to first tell you that uh, one of my colleagues, a biologist, Marcus Feldman, tells me that we have no proof, it's terrible to say this at a college, that knowledge is going to make us a better species. It's true. No proof that it will save us from extinction. But what I want to suggest to you is that knowledge is not only the thing you have in your head, but it's something that you could hold in your heart. And that is something that we, as linguistic animals, have and should nurture. Lastly, Maria. Um, for those of you who are too young to remember, uh, <clears throat> The riot in Los Angeles happened because a black motorist, uh, Rodney King, uh, was beaten by cops. Uh, many people felt the beating was brutal. They went to court. Uh, they came back not guilty. Riots broke out. And then about a year later, President Bush ordered a federal trial, and that trial came back with a verdict of two not guilty and two guilty. Most people thought that if they came back again with all four uh, not guilties, uh, Los Angeles would burst into flames again. So there was a lot of pressure on that jury. And this woman, Maria, gives us an account of exactly how they got to that particular verdict. And this is called AA meeting. Okay, y'all. I'm going to show you how we came up with this verdict, okay? Okay? So we get in here and we say, let's get with the evidence. Let's get with the evidence. And we got about half the testimonies because we started with Pal. And it was leading so much with, on, towards guilty. And somebody said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's just stop. You know, I think what we should do, you know, I'm tired. Let's just color code our book. Oh, color code your book. That's put, like you put looking like a little green tab here because you want to find out, say what the highway patrol said. So that's what we did for that whole first day. We just color code our book. Okay. So um, we spent the whole day doing that. The next day we come back in here and things is going good and somebody said oh man you know I'm tired I'm really tired I think we should just quit for the day and come back tomorrow I just can't take it no more it's just too much on my head okay so I'm thinking all right we quit we go back to the hotel right and I'm thinking you know every time we quit we go backwards right because we're not supposed to talk about the case outside and people wouldn't talk about the case but they would talk about the person and that's not talking about the case that's talking about the person but um like sometimes at breakfast they were saying things like you know uh look at Rodney King why should we be spending all this money on a man like that and to me that's saying like this man, you know, well, he did this to this police officer, so why should we be spending all this money for somebody like that? And they would talk about his parole holes, and all this stuff did not have, did, did, that did not have nothing to do with this case. This case was, was Rodney King civil rights violated. Not what kind of man was Rodney King or what kind of man the defendants were, and it didn't come up in the courtroom, so it should not be coming up in this breakfast room anyway. Um, so um, we get back in here the next day, and things is going pretty good, you know, let's get with the evidence, and um, 
this lady says, oh my God, I think I'm getting a headache. You know, I think I'm getting, I'm going brain dead. Um, uh, I think, I, you know, let's just go back to the hotel. You know, I'm going brain dead. I said, well, you know, I don't want to go back to the hotel. I said, there's nothing to do back there but eat or sleep. I said, I don't want to go back there. I want to stay here. So uh, the foreman says, okay, you know, everybody, you know, M Maria, just calm down, calm down. We're not going to go back to the hotel. We're going to stay here. But what we're going to do, we all going to do what we want to do for the rest of the afternoon. So that's what we did for the whole rest of the afternoon. We just do what we want to do. Okay. So um, now we come back in here the next day, right? And now I'm pissed because it looks like every time we get right here, somebody is tired or somebody has a headache or somebody is brain dead. And so um, I'm arguing with this one guy about all this PCP stuff. He starts saying all this stuff that did not have nothing to do with the trial. I said, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. I said, I do not trust you. I said, I'm looking at this book. This book says this, 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 and this. Uh, I said, I do not trust you. You know, you bull crapping on me. This book says this. So somebody said, now, Maria, Maria, just calm down, calm down. Now, why don't you cuss? Why don't you trust Norman? I said, well, I heard what was going on. I said, it wasn't directed at me. But what do y'all mean? Why should we be spending all this money on a man like that? I said, you know, if you felt that way, you should have said that to the judge in the beginning. Okay. So now Norman got all red in the face, right? Now, the black man, you was at the trail. You saw him. That old black man, him. Him. Now he stands up. Now, Maria, I think you're just being too sensitive about this thing. You know that Norman was just kidding, and, and we've been playing ever since we got here, and you don't have no right to talk to Norman like that. Well, that just broke me because I didn't expect that from him. And plus, it's just open up for everybody just to jump on me. Yeah, you trying to start some shit. So I ran out the room. I went to the bathroom. You know, I washed my face. I was crying and crying and crying, but I washed my face. You know, I tried to get myself together. You know, I tried to come back in here all strong. I tried to smell. Um, and so, uh, now, if you notice, you know, uh, oh, oh, so now, oh, oh, but when I come back in, now, 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 Norman, the guy who I was having a fight with about the PCP stuff, you know, now, uh, you know, he, he's, he, he's crying. Oh, Maria, I just want you to know that I'm marching the Martin Luther's King March. I don't know what that had to do with anything. <laughs> so now everybody's saying, oh, Maria, you know, we so sorry, we so sorry. That's another thing. I don't know why always, everybody always tell me they sorry. So anyway, now, we come back here, here the next day. Now, if you notice, after that, that day I broke, right? I broke. The next day is the day that everybody started coming out of their prejudice. And the next day is the day we had our AA meeting. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm si Don't laugh. I'm serious. Wait till you hear this. You can go, my God. We get back in here. Nobody couldn't sleep. Nothing. The foreman raised his hand. I just want everybody to know I called Alice a asshole at breakfast. <laughs> Here come Alice, raise her hand. I don't think it's fair for you to call me an asshole like that, and I think you should apologize to me in front of everybody because it's really, really not fair. Here come Norman, raise his hand, because mind, you got to raise hand, your hand every time you speak to, to keep order. I have no intentions of apologizing to Alice. That was not my intentions. I do not respect her. I just want everybody to know that I did call her a asshole at breakfast. Here come this other guy, you know, older, you know, nice guy, raise his hand. Uh, I think that... Uh, 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 Alice uh, and Steve uh, should take this up with each other back at the hotel. Here comes Steve. I have no intentions of getting nowhere near Alice. I do not respect her. If I get one of those one near her, I'm going to knock her fucking head off. Here come Alice. I'm writing a letter to the judge. I'm writing a letter to the judge. I'm in front for my life. I'm in front for my life. Here comes Steve. Alice, 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 Alice. I will not hit you. I will not hit you. I just want everybody to know I don't respect you, but I will not hit you. Here comes the Mexican guy. Anybody who wants to hit me can hit me. I'm free for any punches anybody might want to give. Now we got this young white guy, right, raising his hand. <laughs> you know, uh, I just want everybody to know I agree with Maria. See? Because, you know, when they kept saying it was tired, I told them, I said, I don't believe you when you say you're tired. I said, I work at the post office. I said, I work an eight-hour day. They come and tell me I got two hours overtime. I work two hours overtime, and I do a damn good job of it. And I don't say I'm tired because that is my job, and I'm not tired and this is our job and we are not tired. <laughs> I uh, 
agree with Maria. Don't be pussying around here. If you're so goddamn tired, get your fucking ass out of here. We got three alternates who would love to take your places, so get your ass out of here if you're so tired. Here come the black guy. <laughs> I had no idea for three weeks, for three weeks. I have not had one night of sleep, and I have broken out in hives. And he takes off his shirt, and the man is covered in hives all over his body. He's red all over his body. He's crying and crying so hard. I thought he was going to have a heart attack. He goes running out of the room. I thought he was going to have to have a heart attack. Now we got this high class lady, right? Real good job. She's over in the corner going like this. Oh. 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 Oh, I hate arguing, I hate arguing, I hate arguing. Now she busts out crying. Oh, please, if anybody writes a movie, anybody writes a book, oh, please, don't say nothing about my family. And she starts telling us all this stuff about her family. Which we didn't know, so why is she telling us now? Now the black guy got rushed to the hospital because he almost had a heart attack and we had to quit. It was in the paper. Look in your computers in the paper. We had to quit. Now you know why we had to quit now. If you notice, after that day, everybody broke, right? You know, everybody broke, you know, and or they started coming out of their, you know, once they started coming out of their, you know, their guilty, you know. Their, now what I'm trying to say is once everybody's personal guilt was out on the table, uh, then we could push it aside and we could get to the evidence. Such and such said this. Such and such said that. Boom, 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 boom. Guilty. Nobody cried. Nobody argued. We just went through the evidence. And we came to a verdict on pal like that. Guilty. It took us five days, four and a half days. Get to that AA meeting. After that AA meeting, it took us two days to come up with a verdict on all four of them. That's it for coming out of your safe houses. Thank you.